Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, so this first uh, session in the morning is on stats. So it will the goal is just to give you the background of basic uh, univariate and multivariate and uh, other class twin approach. And uh, we will uh, followed by the metabolites because there's a lot of the uh, concept is built in the tools. And if you understand this uh, concept behind it, and it will make it uh, uh, more easy to interpret the result. And uh, uh, here's the schedule, and you already know, and we just uh, skip this. And uh, yesterday we uh, covered uh, uh, several topics, and, uh, and particularly uh, compound identification, uh, quantification for the MR using basal and uh, GC autofit. And so for the um, result, and you, if you open from Excel uh, sheet, you can see that's a list of compounds with the uh, uh, names sometimes with the LODs or uh, range. And for uh, untargeted uh, metabolomics, if you use XMS, you, you'll get a, uh, a pick list, so you won't get common names. And uh, so eventually, uh, we get a large table contains all the values, and be it uh, compounds, be it uh, picks, and uh, it's all kind of uh, features. So uh, from this uh, large a table, we want to get some important information. What's the patterns? Uh, what's the pathways? And uh, can we build a model to predict? So and this is the goal for today's uh, um, kind of the main theme. Uh, what's the statistical approach to do these task, tasks? What's the tool to help us to uh, get there? So, and today, uh, I think they, they are the same. Uh, this is from uh, uh, the yesterday and today. Uh, we just mentioned it from the uh, tables uh, to patterns to the pathways to the models, and so the left hand side is a uh, uh, representative table. But actually, when we doing a statistical analysis, sometimes we upload a list of the compound names doing something. Most time, it's a table like an Excel uh, spreadsheet. So it's a uh, Contains the information that's more um, more numerical, and this list contains a lot of information. Uh, it's for human uh, read. So today, if we're doing something, we need to uh, sometimes we need to manually clean it because some uh, information is uh, uh, for human to read, some is uh, for machines. So that's uh, uh, there's uh, some difference here. So we have. Uh, Three main objectives. One is uh, uh, basic concepts about uh, uh, summary statistics, normal distribution, and uh, uh, p-values. We are particularly we are going to focus on t-tests and ANOVA, which is for two groups uh, or three group groups for univariate analysis. So this is very uh, basic, but it's actually very useful. If uh, a lot of this uh, uh, large data, if we uh, this, we start from univariate, then gradually move to more advanced. It's a uh, multivariate. Uh, in particular, we are going to focus on this clustering and the principal component analysis and the par partial least square discriminant analysis. So, if you were in metabo, uh, metabo, metabolomics uh, field, you'll hear these names a lot because uh, uh, you get the data, and uh, uh, most of the published literature will use this. Uh, St uh, statistical techniques to analyzing data. So it's, a, it's better we understand what's the statistical concepts, how to use it, how to interpret it, and uh, what's, what's the model is good, what's is not good. So this is, a, uh, we try to um, cover this uh, basic uh, stuff. So let's go to a very high level, and what is statistics? So uh, there's a, of, uh, Different de definitions for uh, for our purpose. The statistics are tools to help us understanding complex data, which we just cannot uh, eyeballing a uh, spreadsheet just to feel it, because the data is large and complex, and so many peaks, so many compounds, and so many samples, and uh, uh, we can view it, spend a significant am amount of time, and uh, whether the pattern is robust, whether there's a real pattern, we're not quite sure. So we need a statistic to help. Statistics help you. Basically, extract the information and 
and also test whether this information, the patterns, is uh, more likely to be a real signal, the real patterns, or likely to be just by random. So this is a um, very important statistic help us to um, distill the information from large amount of data. And this information can help us make decisions whether it's true, uh, reject now hypothesis. So this is a, um, statistics. So uh, to use any of these uh, tools or even a command line uh, program, uh, we need to understand what's the input and what's the output. So in our uh, metabolomics uh, data uh, in this uh, context, most time we need to give the tool as a, a data matrix. A matrix just like a data frame, uh, a table uh, in your Excel uh, spreadsheet and it contains all the values like uh, concentrations and the peak intensities if you use a diff report from yesterday's uh, uh, exercise. And uh, the other part we need uh, called the metadata. So this is probably new terms. Metadata actually group, group labels. So this uh, all the ages, gender. So all the information, it's uh, kind of your experimental design. It's called the data about data. So um, a lot of times, especially in clinical studies, they, they have multiple metadata. So sometimes it's become very complex. The metadata itself is a table also. And, uh, but in today, we mainly going to focus on uh, one uh, experimental factors, basically disease control. And uh, uh, we, uh, sometimes we also have some time difference with, uh, within different uh, um, experimental uh, uh, studies. So that's uh, another uh, commonly used design. So from this type of input, what we want to get is uh, significant features. So this is basically what we think about biomarkers. Or in, if you're familiar with gene expression analysis, they differentially express the genes. So this is called a significant features. The features can be compounds, can be peaks. And the, the other ones, the patterns. These patterns, how, how do we see these patterns? It's through the clustering analysis. And we're going to tell some uh, um, technology like uh, PCA, which essentially is a clustering, and heat map, also a, a clustering things and uh, uh, support a um, self-organizing map. We're also going to talk briefly about uh, how do we um, put uh, samples or features that are similar to each other, more close to each other, and visually representing it. So it's called a clustering. And uh, somehow we can also build a models to make predictions. Uh, some model is more transparent. You actually can see the rules behind it, uh, uh, con concentration, uh, mm, uh, like decision trees, like logistic uh, regressions, they can actually you can see what's the, how decision was made. This concentration plus that concentration is higher than this, and this this kind of the condition. So some of the uh, models actually uh, easy to understand, but a lot of the more advanced uh, uh, algorithm is uh, you it's hard, it's very complex. People still treat it as a black box. So uh, uh, that's. Uh, that's, there's rules, but there's some rules. Uh, it's still rules, but it, we just uh, too complex for us to uh, intuitively interpret in a way. So uh, data. Let's go back to this uh, uh, input data. So we're talking about this matrix uh, for metabolomics. So this matrix is a uh, quantitative data, and uh, um, the, there's two type of data. So uh, in the concentrations in our metabolomics, it's called a continuous because it's a, a concentration from uh, from zero to all the way what's measurable concentration. The other one is very common. It's, it's we call it a discrete. This uh, this comes up with uh, RNA seq data. If we're doing a gene expression doing RNA seq, we the their expression uh, abundance is using counts. So how many times you see this transcript in the gene expression? And it's a sequence count. It's integers. It's one, two, three, or ten thousand. So it's the integers, and you don't have the fractions. So it's uh, the other one called discrete. But essentially, it's a quantitative, uh, a quantitative table. And based on this table, and you're doing a lot of statistics and visual uh, visualization. So the other one is categorical. This is our group labels or metadata. 
and uh, uh, typically we have this uh, binary and uh, basically x a uh, yes or no and uh, male female this is the uh, two groups and nominal is usually more than two groups so um, low high media okay this is a uh, more ordinal so sometimes you have this uh, ordinal is uh, not only multi groups also all the matters so so here we're talking about this uh, uh, quantitative data so yesterday we already see our data from metabolomics is all uh, concentration which is a continuous value is have fractions have the uh, it's double uh, things and the uh, screenshot I, sh I showed on the uh, right is uh, uh, is a uh, RNA seq data. So left uh, the the it's a gene a gene name. It's a uh, from Anzamo on the right hand side. It's all their expression values. You can see it's all integers. Some is zero. Some is one hundred. This is a uh, is from next generation sequencing. So it's a uh, uh, discrete. They call it discrete. Yeah. Usually, this uh, different. Uh, um, uh, Continuous and discrete, you need to treat it uh, slightly different. So RNA uh, statistics versus metabolomics, and you need to treat them differently, or you need to transform them to be continuous. So, so categorical data and the binary, which is uh, two groups, you can label it as use the numbers like zero, one, yes or no, case control. Uh, normal disease, so you, you you can write some code. Only you understand. Nobody else understand. So it's all fine. But the suggestion is try to use a, a very short and concise uh, concise label. And some people use labels very long, and in between there's a, a space. So it, this kind of uh, uh, habit is okay if you just uh, uh, manually doing it. But when you upload to a computer computer program, a lot of time they, it it when they plot a long name with space, sometimes cause issues. So, and here we just have yes, no case control. This is very clear. For the nominal data, so here the example: is single, married, divorced, widowed. So this is a, a you can have all these multi groups, and all this is not important. So the ordinal data, there's one called this. Uh, Low, medium, high. So sometimes uh, uh, you can treat even time series as this ordinal data. Uh, ordinal data is uh, more specially uh, categories, but we are not going to cover this, and uh, we just focus on the binary and uh, basically two group and multi groups. So some terms is um, uh, why we uh, talking about this. Uh, uh, features and tables. So there's a um, there's a important statistical concepts is that uh, we talk about the data we get is observed values of the variables. So uh, in our metabolomics uh, data, we have a big uh, uh, table, and uh, each compound is uh, uh, is uh, variables. So all the values we see married for this compound across different content, uh, different samples, and uh, and that's that's we observed values for this compound. So that's the observed value for a variable. Uh, so this uh, uh, variable uh, or this compound is a is a characteristics of this uh, um, populations or the samples. So uh, be it uh, genes, be it uh, compounds, be it uh, peaks. So uh, we see from large populations a range of possible values for variables. So based on this uh, variable, we can compute in this uh, mean, uh, standard deviations, and normal range of versus disease. See, it's upregulated, downregulated. So um, across populations, which include the, uh, we have different experimental conditions, and uh, we're talking this uh, high dimensional data. So the dimension is means how many variables. So in our metabolomic data, if we're talking about uh, targeted metabolomics, we have um, uh, like a GC, we have yesterday, I, I'm not quite recall, like a six, 16, 15, 16 around of compounds being quantified, identified. So that will be dimension is 16 or uh, 15. So that's it. If we're talking about the peaks, so yesterday we have um, hundreds of peaks, 12,000 peaks. So that's the dimension much higher. So uh, the dimension is the number of the variables in your data. It's not number of the samples in your data. We talk about uh, uh, variables, which. 
So um, we're constantly talking about this univariate, um, multivariate. So this is a uh, um, commonly used univariate is that we only consider one of variables uh, 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 per subject at the same time. So uh, we just consider one, and doing this analysis, you consider, this, uh, consider these variables, one genes, one compounds. And if we're talking about bivariate, we consider two genes or two compo compounds at the same time. Multivariate is consider uh, kind of all the variables simultaneously. So it's talking about uh, uh, if we apply like a t-test um, across all the compounds, it's still univariate because we consider one at a time, we just apply it again and again. So it's not a multivariate, it's just you repeat the same thing. If we talk, later we're talking about PCA, which is taking a whole table in one go and compute a pattern, which is multivariate. So uh, this is a... Um, So this is uh, uh, still related to why we care about the statistics, why we should uh, uh, pay attention and talking about these p-values, uh, probabilities, uh, on this, uh, using statistics on, this, uh, uh, on our omics data analysis. And uh, the fundamentally, we are collecting our samples. These samples is from a large population. And we, unless we exhaust the whole population, like uh, tens of thousands, all the patients, all the populations. And we, most time, we only have a very small subset of this whole population. And from this small subset, say it's 20 control, 20 disease. And we derive some descriptive statistics, like their ranges, their mean standard deviation. And we use these uh, values to see that whole population is uh, the most likely, the uh, normal is like this, and disease like that. So we actually we run some risk because you didn't see the whole population. You only see a small part. And you try to infer the big population. So the, there's a certain probability or uncertainty involved with this. So this, how do you quantify these uncertainties? You need to use statistics. Here's some uh, just to try to uh, give you an intuitive feeling about why our uh, inference and sometimes it's inaccurate or um, is from the same normally distributed uh, samples, uh, populations. And we have these some samples, and we, and we try to infer what's the whole pop, the, the population looks like, the, their variance. And you can see based on the two uh, sample point, and here and here, one is uh, um, more or less similar to uh, the overall population. The other one will be more broad distributed. And they remember, this is all from same population. The only thing is the sampling uh, different uh, 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 different uh, uh, places. So you get uh, uh, get the inference is slightly different. So this is uh, some uncertainty variation. We need to quantify it. We need to uh, describe it in a way. So um, the question: How do we know whether the uh, effect we observed in our samples was true or genuine? And the answer is that we don't. We just, uh, uh, we only know our samples, whether this is uh, still true holds on large uh, populations. And uh, we, we're not sure unless we uh, have all the population data. How do we uh, quantify these uh, uh, uncertainties? And we use p-values. So. Uh, p-values indicate our levels of certainty that our results represent a genuine effect, represent the whole population. So, so we just try to put it in, in the other way is that uh, uh, the risk we want to make. So uh, if we think uh, if um, the probability uh, we see these patterns or these signals by chance. Uh, if it's ch the chance is very low, and uh, we think we can accept it, and uh, like uh, in our case, and uh, we're talking about uh, 0.05. So the, if the p-value is less than uh, 0.05, we think it's uh, okay, it's acceptable. It's most likely uh, it's to be true. So this is a probability that the observed result was obtained by chance. So basically, uh, 
what's the chance it's not, it's actually fake uh, patterns. The chance is below 0 0.05, and we think it's, uh, it's acceptable. So it's, again, this is really based on the uh, field, but uh, we usually use a 0 0.05 as a cutoff. And uh, uh, yeah, in certain fields, you can need to be more stringent. Yes? Of ceramics, they use 0 0.01. So, 0 0.01, yeah. Uh, so, uh, for metabolomics, is there a rigid? We have to use 0 0.05 or we can go up? You can go up. At, uh, it's really dependent on the particular situations. And especially if you go to a, a clinical samples, it's hard to obtain and hard to. Um, and. Uh, you can use slightly use higher. I know, I know it's um, um, yeah, point to 0.1. I, I know people sometimes can argue and it's still okay. But if you really go to this uh, very um, uh, clinical application and very stringent things, you really want to go more strict. And there's some concerns with that. But there's always a situation like you just cannot get enough samples. Or this is a whole field that the 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 signal is very low, and uh, mm. so uh, 0.05 is not a magic number, and uh, it's uh, 0 0.01 is fine, 0 0.001 is all fine. So uh, it's really uh, the cutoff is based on that your uh, what's kind of uh, uh, literature, your community, which which uh, which field you apply, and you see what's the published data, what's their cutoff. You try to respect that. If you cannot meet that. And you really think you did a, a very good uh, uh, work. It's just uh, uh, it's marginal, and you can make uh, some argument. Say what's the situation and uh, what's uh, what's uh, the validation. Especially p values just give you uh, 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 quantification about uh, what's uh, what's the chance, uh, what's the, the 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 patterns by chance. But if you really followed by your doing a uh, like a, G, a QPCR or doing a validation, and you actually see it. So all the p-value doesn't really matter because you validated it. It's true. It's there, and you you found it. So the thing here is that uh, at the initial exploratory stage, it helps you to uh, filter this uh, signal that's more likely to be false positive. Uh, so if you really, really already uh, have validation, that's a really p-value doesn't matter. You can just say I rank it. I just pick it. But it's turned out to be true, and then that's true. That's uh, the validation is the uh, biological validation or analytical validation. That's uh, it's uh, that's really that's a more gold standard. So uh, now we are going to talk about some general, uh, uh, quite uh, widely used uh, summary of descriptive statistics. And uh, so if we have a bunch of values, and uh, uh, just uh, like a million uh, values. And uh, we cannot just enumerate these values. We need to summarize in a few, in a few, as less as possible. So what we usually do is that uh, first we describe the central tendency, the location. Where is the most uh, dots, most values concentrated on? We just uh, found uh, uh, that, that uh, one single value. As we use it called the mean media or mode. So the other one, what's the spread? So if we have this single values, most most uh, values actually just spread around this single value. What's the distrib what's the spread around this? If it's uh, everything is actually the same, exact same spot, one million uh, value, all the same value. Basically, you just one value represent everything. But a lot of time, actually, you have the one central centers. There's, uh, other ones spreading around. So you want to measure the spread. So the wider the spread and the, the less meaningful your center. Because this is so spreading wide, the, uh, widely around. And this, uh, sen this single value mean or stuff is not mean, mean so much. But it's the spread is very, very, very narrow. And all around this single value. And the, 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 this mean or median will be very meaningful. Because most other values are very close to that. So how do we measure variability? Is a, a standard deviations and variance. So it's a, um, a basically a spread. A lot of times we also use other measures like a quantiles, a range, 
and interquantile range. So why we use this is because uh, variance or standard deviation is really derived from normal distribution. And uh, there, uh, if we use some <coughs> irregular distributions, and uh, it's not a good summary of variance. So uh, people use quantile zero range, and it is, uh, IQR is uh, quite common. So we are going to dis uh, just to see what each one represent. Okay. So uh, the first is the mean, media, and mode. And uh, mostly we focus on the normal distribution. So if you're really perfectly normally distributed, they are the equal. And, uh, but in a skewed distribution, and it's going to be uh, different. So the mean is average value, and uh, the extreme values uh, on the left, on the right side, will be affecting the mean values. And uh, to address this, and people can compute the median, so the middle most. So the median is less, more robust, and less uh, affected by these uh, extreme outliers. And mode is most common value. So for us, the most useful is mean and median. So <clears throat> here just shows on a slightly skewed distribution where the mean, median, mode are lo located, just to give you some feelings. So the mode is a mostly frequent value. So the, here is the one that's in the highest peak, and the median is somewhere in the middle. If you really rank them from the uh, uh, from the high to lower, and median will be the one at uh, 15 there in the middle, and the mean will be slightly skewed here. Uh, it affected by this uh, um, extreme value. In this time, <coughs> the extreme value is more in the right-hand side, so they have some uh, slightly larger values, so this value drags the means to to the uh, to the white. So if it's very symmetrical, like normal distribution, and all the three will overlap. So how do we? Uh, uh, this is we talk about the center. We try to use one value represent the center. So the more symmetrical, the more meaningful uh, the center. This center value mean uh, uh, will be. And uh, <clears throat> after we get a center, we want to get a spread. So what's the things around distribution around the center? So we use that uh, variance, standard deviation. And um, so variance is the average of the square the distance to the center. Uh, the center is mean. So you can also actually uh, you can you can change to the median. So it's if within R you you can cal calculate the statistic very easy. It just mean is so efficient if you're doing the median. And it's uh, probably more computationally in intensive, so uh, you can do everything. Uh, it, there's there's command, just you don't have to write the actual code. You just need. And the standard deviation is a square root of the variance. So s standard is a, um, in this case is a taking square uh, taking square root. So the the, the the unit will be the same. So you, if you want to compare, and the standard deviation. Uh, one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. That's uh, that's kind of you. You can have certain meanings because the same unit, but you don't talk talking about in the variance because it's a squared. Once you have unit squared, we don't uh, cannot relate easily to the situation. The other commonly used term is uh, uh, called the standard error of the mean. So uh, this is to quantify the precision of the mean. So. Uh, <coughs> The the formula on the right is you you see it's divided as standard deviation divided by the square root of the n n is number of samples. So this one is that if you have a large sample, uh, large sample, you you can always have this standard deviation of the mean much slower, uh, uh, much the narrow. So this get it better. So if you, for this one you can just increase the sample num uh, number, you can. Uh, decrease the standard uh, uh, standard error, so that's uh, uh, that's uh, guaranteed because it's uh, uh, within this uh, uh, formula. Now <clears throat> we talk about the first is, is a box plot, and uh, a lot sometimes I do receive people. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was told uh, when I was at least learning the standard uh, error of the mean. Yeah. But you only use it if each sample is actually already is an average of multiple measurements. 
and then you can uh, allow to use standard error on the means. Yes. What I mean is that uh, you already know the value of each sample to be very sure. The already average of uh, yeah. of uh, several repeats, and yeah. then you're allowed to use it. Otherwise, yeah. Uh, 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 no, no, no. Exactly. Uh, that's 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 the case. With, uh, we, in our case, we use a variance, a standard uh, deviation. We don't use standard uh, deviation uh, error means. This is uh, uh, for a different application. And exactly as you mentioned, that's uh, but uh, uh, the thing is, that I don't want people to get confused. People think a standard de deviation, a standard error, the same thing. It's not. So it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, so uh, first one is on the box plot. Sometimes I do receive people asking, "Hey, what's that uh, image looks like? Uh, what's the, how do you interpret that?" So I, I just uh, send them a Google link. This box plot, and you see wh what it <laughs> looks like. So they don't even know this. It's called box plot. This name. So it's just kind of a screenshot asking me what it uh, means. So that's uh, kind of uh, um, come up with these slides. It's uh, I just make sure we understand the box plot. So the box plot is uh, very, very useful. Uh, for all this data, metabolomics, genomic, uh, gene expression, we should uh, uh, have a box plot overview of our samples. It's easy to see the outliers st uh, stuff. So uh, if we're doing a box plot, we can see there's uh, <coughs> several marks. And here's the minimum, here's the maximum. And in between, this is quantiles. Quantiles uh, is basically you rank all your values from um, Let's see, from 100 to 1 to 100, and you see that uh, 20, uh, 25 uh, percent is here, and 15 percent is here. 15 percent is the, uh, you know this is the, it became the median, okay? 75 percent is here, and uh, and 100 percent. So if you really rank our samples like this, but some of the box plot actually have this defined. If it's 2.5 away fr uh, from this uh, um, uh, median. It will define some outliers, so you will see some little circles around. So this is a uh, uh, really this is not a um, it just to show you uh, what's the uh, uh, range. So this is uh, can be slightly different, but uh, the overall it's uh, it's should it's like this. So Q three is uh, uh, like let's see. Interquantile range. We we talking about it. one thing I mentioned. Interquantile range is from 75 to the uh, 25 percent. So you can see that uh, if we do a normal distribution, that's is a uh, uh, majority of the data values captured here, and uh, it's more uh, meaningful data if we think it's relatively symmetrical, centered. So compare this uh, range, how much the spread is more. Mm -hmm. Uh, meaningful focus on this because if we go to the including the range everything from the minimum to maximum and we are more susceptible to these outliers so the <clears throat> in the quantile range especially we don't know the why this normal this uh, 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 not normal distribution is more robust approach so if it's normal uh, normally distributed in the quantile range and the whole range will be same but if it's not normal distributed, in the quantile range will be more robust because uh, the outlier here and here will be ignored. So this is a uh, uh, byte. Yes? Hi, sorry. Um, I was curious if there's like a minimum number of samples, like an n value, that you wouldn't go below to use box plots. Because we've had this discussion in my lab before. Yeah, what's your, uh, what's your thinking on that? Like three to five, less than that is a bad idea? But, or is it higher than that, do you think? Yeah, <laughs> if we're talking about a uh, differential analysis, usually people recommend. Uh, uh, yeah, we talk about the minimum actually five and to six, so with per group, right? Yeah. So total, we're going to have about uh, ten or twelve. So in that case, you you can see um, yeah, you can see a box plot, but how much confidence there? As, <coughs> as you you can see, uh, if especially we have this uh, large number of the samples, and in in this um, uh, omics, we can kind of borrow. Uh, the the distribution across a lot of the uh, compounds are similarly with the range, right? You can still see some trend where it holds. Everybody have this kind of the variance, uh, like uh, similar. So, but the minimal, yeah, and five, six. That's but metabolomics. We should we should aim for more. And uh, okay. Thank you. yeah, there's uh, no hard. You have to do this, that, but the more sample, you have more confidence. That's just the, the data point used to average, to, to calculate where's the mean, where's the quantile 
a range. So if you have more data points, you have more uh, confident uh, estimation. So there's, uh, the other part is you, you can uh, see across different compounds, di across different genes. If you more or less have the similar patterns, then that's, that's more, uh, you should feel more comfortable about that. So here's a, a mean versus variance. We're talking a lot about the mean. We was talking a lot about variance. And these two are very related. <clears throat> and here this graph shows uh, uh, we want to make our judgment based on the mean. As mean is different, and we really think uh, it's significantly different. We think these two populations is like, uh, uh, different. The disease um, is significant uh, from this control. But the confidence actually is based on the uh, variance, very important. You can see that uh, uh, from this side, if we have a smaller variance, the separation will be more sharp. And we see the overlap much smaller. We, we are more confident, like uh, this is really different. But if we in the bottom, if the variance is large, we see a lot of overlap. So even the same difference in the mean, but you, you know there's a lot of overlap. The confidence is much low. So this one is... Uh, Really, um, how uh, oh, how we going to quantify this uncertainty? If we talk, if we really uh, go see the how the t-test or the ANOVA has been uh, calculated, they really quantify this uh, uh, mean versus uh, variance. So the larger the the variance, the the p-value will be less significant. So the, here it shows that uh, um, uh, give the same variance, and uh, the more the, the difference in mean, the more likely this, this is from two population. This is very clear. But uh, here it uh, shows that uh, um, same mean, uh, the less, the more narrow the spread, the better. Okay. So uh, now we talk about the univariate statistics in more details, and. Uh, uh, we focus on one particular uh, variables, like uh, one uh, compound, like uh, um, alanines, like uh, here is that uh, we uh, talk about the weight and height and IQs test scores. And uh, if we marry that variables over a whole population and plotting this uh, 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 frequencies, how much the value is distributed across this whole population. And, uh, and uh, like a hist histogram we showed on the uh, first uh, um, our tutorial, how do we, if we plot uh, millions of uh, values, and we will, we will see a, a shape like this. It's like a, a bell curve. So this is a typical uh, um, distribution for some biologically uh, relevant uh, measurement. If you have a large population like thousands, and you, you, a lot of time you will see a, a shape like this, so normally distributed uh, uh, values. Human height and weight is a very uh, kind of very typical, and uh, especially you have a large population when you plot, it seems uh, uh, quite satisfying to see uh, this uh, distribution again and again. So the normal distribution, you have this, uh, um, uh, uh, the formula you don't have to remember, but it, it really uh, uh, gives you some hint about this is mean, and this is uh, standard deviation. Uh, here, you don't have to remember this because uh, we calculate everything as uh, in R, and we, we can easily calculate all the um, uh, values. Uh, so we focus on this normal distribution. So normal distribution is a symmetrical distribution. So symmetrical means the mean, media, and mode will overlap, and uh, <coughs> and we have a. Uh, standard deviation, uh, which is the same unit as we mentioned, and we actually can quantify uh, the standard deviation and uh, one standard deviation uh, uh, above this, um, uh, around this uh, mean, and it will be, I don't know, 19, no, 16.6 uh, percent, and two standard deviation will be 95 percent of the population will be within. So uh, people are actually very uh, familiar with the distribution. They, they have an intuitive interpretation. So I hope uh, after this uh, uh, lecture, we, can, we, we also have certain uh, feelings about these numbers. 
so this normal distribution is uh, 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 very uh, often observed in a biological physical measurement. So a lot of times, the number itself, if you plot them, it seems normally distributed. Sometimes it's slightly not normal, but you can easily fix them, doing some log transformation and doing something to make it normal. So uh, we can now we can do the computing a lot of things using normal distribution. So for our uh, uh, measurement, uh, like metabolomics, and uh, if we want to get a, a, a find this shape, you no know, normal distribution shape. And usually, rule of thumb is 13 to 14. So, if you have this uh, uh, number of samples and try to plot certain values, you, you probably see the shape. But if you really just have about uh, uh, 10 or 12, and this uh, this pattern is not uh, standing out, so you need to have more. So once you have several hundred, the pattern is very obvious standing out. So in large population studies, uh, a thousands. That's that's just a. Uh, mm, a uh, very natural thing. So uh, we already uh, uh, discussed about this uh, uh, mean variance and standard deviation. So here the mean is uh, you sum average values and divide by the number of the uh, 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 number of the values you used, and the variance is you uh, uh, you calculate the distance also divided by the um, Total numbers of the uh, uh, values used. Standard deviation, you take a square root. So, so here's the one I mentioned. So for no perfectly normally distributed uh, values, if we have the standard deviation, and uh, uh, so one standard deviation around this mean, and you have 19, uh, 69 percent uh, 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 area being covered, and if we have two standard deviation. It's uh, it's 99 or 19, uh, 19, it's 95. So three standard deviation is a 99. So uh, some people actually have this very, uh, um, have memories. They can actually see uh, what's a, uh, uh, um, so it, you can see if you are, uh, if your samples or your values located outside the three uh, standard deviation, low or high, it's, uh, the chance is less than 1%. You can see that. Uh, uh, um, what's the chance if uh, because 99 percent of the population will be within this uh, three standard deviation around this mean? A lot of times we don't see perfect normal distribution, and uh, we see uh, uh, we see things uh, like a slight different. One is called a unimodal. If we plot them, we can see the uh, shape like this. It's Seems normal, but it's uh, skewed. So, um, but it's one big hump there, and they sometimes they have the bi model. And basically, you see two peaks around that. Sometimes you see this uh, from uh, uh, your control versus some um, treatment. You see actually the population shift have two models. That's actually not a bad sign. It means you have a very strong signal. So you're really different already. You see that uh, these two populations separated. So. So uh, we know very well about normal distribution. So if it, if a distribution is not normal, and uh, we uh, we try to make it normal, so we can use our statistics. We don't actually develop in uh, all different models for different distributions. We try to use one model that's normal distribution. And if the data is not normal, we try our best to make it normal, so we can still use our model. This is uh, our approach. So for uh, for a distribution like this. And um, uh, this is a, uh, actually, uh, we did that to, to our tutorial. Our concentration data, some of them looks like this, uh, across whole uh, compound merit. A lot of them actually very low concentration, skewed like uh, uh, left, it's uh, saved here. But some of this uh, uh, compound, like acid uh, and uh, glucose, very high. So if you're doing this uh, whole thing and you see the distribution like a uh, very skewed across the whole compound being mirrored, and uh, <clears throat> we cannot apply this normal distribution on this kind of uh, things unless we want to some non-parametric things. So, but we before we try that, okay. Um, sometimes uh, 
we need to find out the outlet yeah. from uh, experiment. Yes. So, what is the general rule to identify the out layer and how I can exclude? Just uh, after identification, I can exclude, or is there anything symmetrical? Uh, it's a very good question. Outlier is really a case by case. So, uh, uh, in in a large population, we do uh, expect to see certain outliers. So, uh, you, you, we can see that uh, even normal distribution, and we see ninety nine percent is within three standard deviation, but there's still one percent outside that. So, the outlier is uh, is uh, is uh, is still part of the uh, normal thing. It's just the on. Uh, Uncommon. So for each outlier, you need to double check whether you have a interpretation for how it happens. If especially if you're doing the experiment and whether it's a contamination, whether it's wrong labeling, and if you have good reason for that, you can exclude it. <clears throat> and uh, you don't want to see because it's slightly outside the range. In this case, it just seems uh, outside of this tail, and you really want to uh, exclude them. Usually, I say my natural extension of just the taping off. So I really don't uh, think uh, in this case you should try to exclude them. Um, but outlier out always you deserve more attention. So if you find the reasons and uh, you can justify it, you can remove it. But if you constantly remove outlier, if you, you remove this outlier, this next one come to it, and you still consider this outlier, if you keep removing it, you really have certain bias. In a large population, there's always certain outliers. So <clears throat> It's part of the reality, and uh, so we don't want to uh, pay too much things. As long as overall pattern is there, the outlier actually sub actually give us certain confidence to see um, the stuff. But uh, but outlier is good is if you have experimental uh, or biological reason for that. Yeah. Is there any <coughs> statistics to find out? Yeah. Uh, outlier. Yeah. I will, in metabolism, there are certain things that make you. Focus. On, hey, seems this feature standing out, but they don't uh, automatically remove it. It's dangerous because this really just the the, the human should think about what they're doing. If you use uh, use the tools to automatically give that, sometimes the focus actually is on finding these outliers. Sometimes in a large population study, in some rare disease, this this uh, one found the patient. Only one have that kind of mutations, and this outlier. You really <clears throat> need to focus on this outlier. So it got to prioritize and uh, make you pay more attention to it. So, but how to define outlier is always uh, based on which part you are looking at, which perspective. So, uh, all the other measurement is normal. Just when you measure this particular genes, oh, this one's all oh, this compound concentration. This is so high for these things. So this uh, <clears throat> definition of outlier is. Uh, uh, context specific. So, yeah. Um, so maybe you'll, you'll talk about this more, but isn't this also a problem for things that are near the detection limit? So, <coughs> if you have like a metabolite and there's a lot of it in, in one population and you have a normal distribution, in the other population, most samples just the zero that you can see, and some of them have maybe a little bit, then that distribution for the for the low abundance is extremely weird, right? And yeah. Can you do statistics between the two? I mean, it's a pretty clear case, right? You yeah. Think yeah. That. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, um, we don't. So the low uh, abundant uh, compounds usually is you don't have too much confidence as the more abundant ones, and. Uh, yeah, you need to uh, think more if your judgment is based on this one. Double check. I know in uh, um, gene expression, RNA seq or microarray, which is more developed, how they deal with this across large studies, across things. They actually, what they suggest, a very extreme in a very late, latest uh, Nature Biotech MIQC uh, studies. They suggest you rank the genes from the most abundant to the least abundant, have the media. And only compare this one's the top half abundant. It's so reproducible, so robust, and the low low abundant they just ignore because this is hardly to reproduce. Uh, and this is based on large scale studies on all the past ten years, twenty years. That they suggest doing this. From it's kind of extreme, but they do emphasize these low abundant things. It's um, 
if you do it within your own lab and you really make sure you have the standard, you have this mixings, and you actually you see the variation, you have the QC samples, you see the uh, co uh, coefficient of variation, everything you see this measurement changes real, and you have your confidence. But if you compare cross studies, you don't know whether that's quality there, and you, you do run this danger, right? Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, running QC samples is important. So if you talk about that, if you, the QC sample are low, but you measure it accurately, and slightly change you also measure it accurately, then your, 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 your platform is really have a good dynamical range, and uh, you're fine. It's just uh, um, mm, usually, uh, it's actually very high abundant, also not good. It's saturating the signal. And uh, the best measurement actually from the IQR interquant from 25% to 75%. Really, that's a sweet spot. And uh, the most sensitive, most equipment is uh, good at that. And uh, but uh, data is valuable. Nobody wants to easily trim their data to only to the very subset. W when they're paying for this omics, you want to see the whole pictures. So you really want to squeeze all the information from that. And uh, so. Um, uh, visualization is important, and use good statistics, and try to judge based on your um, your background. You think it is uh, very low abundant or very high abundant, probably beyond the detection limit, and you give them less weight or less confidence. So uh, that's that's all, all all good practice, I would say. <clears throat> so how do we fix uh, skewed distribution? Uh, so skewed distribution is very common, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, what we try to do is try to do some data normalization or transformation and make it more normally distributed. So outlier in the previous plot, it can be easily become not outlier in once you're doing a transformation. So this is, a, I want to say, is don't try to exclude it at the first. Sometimes we can save by doing the proper transformation, then it became normally distributed. Once it's normally distributed, the statistics became more robust, so we can draw our conclusion more confidently. <clears throat> so here is a skewed distribution, and uh, we see it's uh, like an exponential uh, thing, and uh, uh, we do a log transformation, and you see it's normally distributed. This is a um, theoretical, you can generate in R, and doing the log transformation, you can see it's uh, become normally distributed. And here's actually uh, actual real data. I think it's from about 14, uh, 15 samples. And when you plot them, and you can see that uh, concentration uh, left, left side is skewed. It's a lot of them uh, at the low end. <clears throat> so you apply you apply log, and uh, you can see it's getting better. So log brings extreme values, uh, extreme large values to to this much have less e impact. So be, you can see this um, a magnitude it is from 10,000, 20,000, 15,000. It's just too much. If you're do, doing log, it became mm, 16, uh, 10, 12, 14. So it became more comparable. And you still see a little bit of skewed, but it's uh, uh, more normal. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing a normal, uh, using normal statistics like t-test, and it will be more robust compared to a direct using here. And this, this one actually became better. So the only, only thing that you, you, uh, you mentioned is about when you're doing the log, sometimes the log emphasizes the uh, low. So bring the very high values to less so influential. But on the other hand, bring the low, uh, low end become, uh, to this side. So become more uh, have, have more impact. So if the low abundant value is just not uh, so confident, so it's probably not uh, 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 going to do it. Yeah? So which kind of log transformation will be the better? Log 2 or log 10? Personally, I don't think it matters. And uh, you, you take a log, and you mo mostly you, you see the effect is the uh, same. You can plot log 2 or log 10. You don't see the actual change too much. Yeah? Uh, two quick questions. One, how can you tell if a distribution follows the normal distribution or not if there are any statistics? 
And then the second is if you find it skewed or non uh, does not it does not follow normal distribution, then when you use log transformation and use parametric versus just apply non-parametric statistics. Yeah. <laughs> That's all good questions. So uh, how do you tell it's a normal or not normal? There are certain tests to see, uh, actually to give you a test whether it's normal or not. But the thing that it's not uh, robust, especially you, do, you have very small sample num numbers. We only have uh, uh, 20 samples, so we only have these numbers. So all this uh, uh, testing, whether it's normal or this abnormal, is based on uh, uh, certain assumptions that require you have hundreds of thousands of measurements to, to have draw a conclusion. So the testing of norm normality is uh, um, there's a, there's a, a ways to do it, but it's not working well. And in most time, it gives you very wrong things. You'll reject 90% of your things. It's not normal. So basically, what are you going to do? And uh, uh, the reality is that a t test and uh, it's very robust. So slightly not normal, it is still working fine. So it's visualization then of the... Yeah, you, most time, actually, you do it based on visualization. Also, there's a new statistics. They actually try to borrow some information across different samples, across different variables. And so that kind of thing also increases your estimation of this variable variance and mean. So, so that kind of thing you cannot plot. So, so like this, it's OK. And you don't. Uh, <clears throat> But sometimes you see you, you do see um, uh, very very extreme, and uh, you can try to use uh, unparametric uh, things. And in that case, actually, you can see clearly uh, a lot of cases in my per experience that if you in that case you do in a parametric t test, you get no significance of very few. You use non-parametric, actually, it's fitting well and have more more power. So it's sometimes if you see it's something as Worth trying, you just try it, and sometimes it's uh, it's it's working better actually non-parametric things. So people actually, yeah. Sorry, are there cases where are is it always good to apply a log to to your data, or are there cases where you just shouldn't do it? Uh, in uh, concentration and uh, at least in gene expression, in the metabolomics and. Uh, I think log is uh, most of the time it's working very well on the log scale. So if you see all the normalization in the rna seq microarray metabolomics, it, you try to use a log scale. So unless you have other strong reason not to use it, and um, uh, that's the first thing you have to try. But there's a cubic a root, a cub, cubic root. So there's so here you should see this one. People go in extreme and try all different means, try to make things normal. So it's called a uh, uh, just uh, yeah. I heard from someone says that uh, biological uh, samples are usually uh, not normal distribution, so it's good to use the non parametric. Is it true? I don't know where you get that. I, I think, uh, um, like, uh, last if you screen the last population, their distribution usually not the normal. Or so it's better to use the uh, non parametric. No. I think it's, uh, um, you, uh, if, if you have a large population, just uh, one particular compound, you may, like uh, we want to amino acid in a large population, if you plot it, it will be mostly normally distributed. I don't know where you, what kind of biological stuff. Before we showed the weight or height, it's normally distributed. So it's actually normal distribution is uh, more common in a biological measurement. So that's uh, uh, at least in my experience. So if it's not normal, and you try to take a log or do something, make it normal. Because an unparametric uh, thing that's uh, usually less powerful compared to normal uh, uh, parametric. So you should, uh, if it's not normal, try to normal, then apply parametric. This is uh, the ways. The last is when you try non-parametric. You, you cannot just, uh, just directly go to non-parametric. That's the same to me as uh, you're not uh, making best use of your data. So uh, here is that um, uh, not too latest, but uh, it's still very thorough in explore, uh, exploration of all different ways to improve the data by centering, by scaling, by transformation, and make the data look more normal. So it is uh, published 2006. I think it's cited widely because uh, they did a very thorough job compare all the effect. <clears throat> 
or different things on, on what's possible consequences. And based on that, they make some uh, recommendation. It's not uh, a universal, but it's really reveal what's a complex complexity it can be. The thing that uh, we want to treat our metabolomic data, see, we marry uh, hundreds of metabolites. We cannot each compound use a different uh, transformation. We don't do that. We, if we want to do transformation, we do it uh, consistently. If we do log, and log apply to whole data matrix. We don't want to do this compound. It's not normal. We uh, do a log. That compound seems normal. We don't do log. We don't make judgment on the individual compound. We do it on the whole data matrix. If you do it on the individual compounds, each one doing different, that's usually that's not a good practice. Okay, so we do it. It's consistent across all this um, on the whole table. Okay. And uh, probably you guys already know, but uh, here's the two normal distribution. How do you think? Is it different or not? Is it two population or one? I think if it is the uh, same, raise your hand, you think. <laughs> no, it's just uh, two, uh, just uh, uh, this is we talk not about transformation. So we talk about are they different or not? This is to America. Yeah, it seems different. <laughs> yeah. Here's that. Um, how about this? That's less certain, right? So here is that uh, uh, we already mentioned about uh, even the um, the the difference between the mean. And also the variance have a play an important effect in our decision. How confident we are? This is from two populations or same populations, and we need to quantify this uncertainty. And uh, how do we do the uncertainty? Uh, quantify it. We we do a t-test in the two for the two uh, samples. So t-test is uh, kind of most commonly used. It compare uh, between. Uh, compare the means between two uh, two conditions. So our assumption is that if they are from the same population, they should share the similar means, also similar variance actually. Mm. But the variance I showed you is that if you really draw it a slight different, sometimes you see the variance is, uh, could be different. So the t test actually two different flavors. You have a two the variance. You have a different variance to calculate it. That's uh, uh, that's a parameters equal variance equal or variance unequal. So that's the whole thing. So if we uh, uh, if these two means are statistically different, then the samples are likely to be drawn from two different populations. So this is uh, uh, what we try to see if we can uh, make these conclusions. <coughs> so types of t test. Uh, uh, so if a sample is all independent, uh, each one from different uh, uh, patient, different uh, people, and we're talking about this independent. But sometimes you do the drug treatment, so before and after. So actually the sample is uh, paired, so we do the set paired t-test. And for each uh, t-test, we also have the non-parametric version. And the man witness u test for the independent, or well coxon test for the um, paired test. And for even for the parametric test I mentioned about uh, b before that, uh, um, we have a student's t test is testing two populations that have the normal distribution and equal means. This is most time if we assume they are from the same population, it should have the same same mean and same variance. We assume they are equal variance. And uh, in some cases, uh, and people are doing a Welch t test as designed for the unequal variance. Basically, if you're doing a t test, you have the parameter equal variance, non equal variance. So this is a uh, uh, default is equal, so it's most powerful. <clears throat> what do you mean by equal value? Yeah, so uh, you see this one? Uh, they have different means, but the spread is same, right? And here is the same. We have the uh, uh, we compare the means, but the spread is the same. We we can pull the whole two groups and estimate the variance. What's that? But if the one is small, the other one big. You, you see the very early slides. I, I, I'm, I'm just so in. I'm not quite sure I get there. Yeah, here. You see the variance is different. 
so so this is a so in our t test we do a student t test it's assumed that as equal variance okay as uh, uh, most powerful uh, yeah can you explain um, like parametric versus non-parametric like how you would know which one you are <laughs> so uh, I already mentioned if uh, the data is relatively normally distributed, and you should try to use a parametric. It's more powerful, and um, if it have extreme values, and you clearly see some outliers, try non-parametric. So, okay. uh, Sometimes you do see that non-parametric gives you more significant uh, uh, number of significant features. Uh, uh, this. Metabolomics most time is parametric because it's very continuous, normally distributed. I, I'm seeing this from the microbiome. It's so extreme, and disregarding how much you do, it's just so not normal. Yeah. Okay, so there's no like hard and fast rule. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. No. I. So most data has some some normally some data has equal variance and some is wide difference in variance. Yeah. When do you how do you decide what is too much or too little? Because you're doing the same test, you're going to do the same transformation on all the all the samples. Yeah. So your decision has to be based on all the samples. Yeah. And this is it. You are talking about a very good situation. We do uh, uh, we do see the things you just described, and. Um, so the, for the when we do a large scale uh, omics study, we have to consider the overall trend and apply some more consistent things. If you really go to individual cases, particular variables, really, it's probably you better use equal variance, and this is use different uh, normalization to make that particular variable more normal. But we just uh, cannot afford the the time spending on trying to decide which one for this particular. Compounds or for particular genes. What's the what's the best transformation? What's the best statistic? Is the equal variance, non-equal variance? So we just try to apply a method that seems the majority seems to agree. So in particular case, it could not be optimal. But this is your practice, and we just cannot go to uh, back to the individual cases study it to optimal, because the time and the things that uh, even you know it, you just cannot afford doing it. Right. So in general, you would use non-parametric or you would transform because um, from what you're saying, then because my understanding is no equal variance is a serious no. You no, most these tests that test variance, so unequal variance is in most normal. cases. In most cases, when you're doing a transformation, uh, doing log transformation or visualization, and you see it actually normally distributed and variance largely equal most time. So uh, in unless uh, I mean, something reads you along. Most time, this is the assumption holds. So I can see, like, see ninety-five percent. So you don't have to worry too much. So I, I think uh, uh, there's certain cases do need to attention. But uh, if we we cannot focus too much on that, it's basically you see some studies point out the majority, uh, the practice holds. So we're just talking about the general rules. Individual case, I agree. We you spend the time and plotting that and just find what's the best to do that. That's uh, uh, I've got a follow up question. Right? Yeah. Um, if we do transform, log transform, yeah. is the custom in metabolomics to report in the descriptive statistic a geometric mean or an actual mean? So, uh, all p values, uh, computing these p values, um, like, uh, like doing PC, the graphics. Uh, uh, this one, you have been used transformed data. But if you really want to report absolute quantification using like uh, using biomark, you still go back to this. Once you see this significant, you need to go back to the original uh, values. See what's the uh, absolute uh, 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 concentrations. So you don't uh, you re use you calculate these p values if you use the overall like a PCA, PRSDA. You use the transformed data to do that. But if you re want to report the values, you need to use the raw concentrations. Yeah. Okay. Do you report geometric or actual? If you've got a skewed distribution and you've tested log transform data, yeah. do you report geometric means or actual? In metabol yeah, you, in metabolism, you have both. So you, you're going to see both. One is actual means from actual values. The one is transformed in log trans. You have a box plot. So you're going to show so both. So uh, again, I'm. you just respect your field. 
if your field they, they report the things as uh, geometric actual and you just follow that and the uh, tools will allow you to get both so this is not a very hard question it's just uh, uh, what's the uh, practice in your field I think Uh, so here is uh, we go, went through this test, and we're talking about this uh, um, um, paired t test. So the paired t test is um, uh, helped to reduce the mean because uh, same person uh, tested it before and after. The same person will help you uh, when you're doing a. Uh, subtract the same person in the background they will have much sharp signals so once you do, if you do that uh, if sample is really paired the design and you do the pair that you can see the significance is so much and that everything is much improved here it just shows on on the left side is that uh, you have your decision here but if the spread is so big the variance is so big and here is uh, a lot of uncertainties but if with this uh, narrow and narrow uh, smaller variance by like use paired design and you, you get much more confident much more stronger uh, significant p-values so the the narrow the variance the much uh, significant your p-values so if your sample is paired and use pair, use paired test uh, sometimes uh, physicians actually try to match uh, based on age and medical history uh, in, f on the patient pairing so even it's not the same person but they try to pa do the pair uh, if you know they have more background to reduce uh, variance. Now I think we cover all the t-tests and we are going to uh, discuss about ANOVA. So ANOVA is uh, <clears throat> for more than two groups. So the hypothesis is that uh, we have uh, all the means are the same and uh, uh, the alternative basically what say one is uh, two or more means are different from the other. So if you see this one you will realize ANOVA significance is that uh, uh, they tell you there's a difference between the between these means but who is different from uh, who and you don't know but uh, that's uh, that's ANOVA uh, try to do and uh, <clears throat> the issue is that uh, the difference it really is uh, relative speaking so for example how much difference is, uh, is, is big enough so we need to compare the mean difference versus again versus the variance but this variance is uh, uh, is within the group between a group so this is a uh, uh, test is uh, slightly different from uh, t-test because t-test is two samples is relatively easy so <clears throat> so ANOVA try to uh, actually formulate test uh, between group variability uh, divided by the within group variability so what we really want to see a big effect is that uh, between group there's a huge difference right the group a group b is a huge difference within group is supposedly more consistent and basically we want to have very homogeneous group within each populations but uh, between group will be uh, very different so here it, you, you can see that um, uh, blue red and green and you can see that uh, within each group very consistent homogeneous you and uh, but between group they have a large difference so this is what they test so the more uh, homogeneous within group more different between group you have a larger p-values and the larger p-value means more significant p-value large f so uh, large f values more significant p-values it's very intuitive you can see from here you want to know, ideally you want to see each sample is so narrowly focused here and here and between them is so far away but within each uh, population is so close so um, so this F test, the between group variability, within group variability, is very useful skills. We don't do F test, but we can sometimes we do use for other algorithms uh, because that's uh, this kind of thinking is very um, useful. Yeah. So, so the group variance or variability yeah. is just the mean of each. Uh, and those are the values of the population, or to calculate the, the group variability. Yeah, you, you see, uh, you, you see these slides here. We, we actually define uh, the between group and the within group variance. So 
so let, let's talk about here within this red group. Within group variance, they, they are each uh, each value uh, how much different to their own uh, mean. Okay, within this group, okay, they have the mean is the mean is here, and each value compared to this mean, what's the what's the dif difference, right? And uh, here's the between group is that uh, uh, here uh, to here, so it's across. It's don't they don't com compare within the group, compare across. Right, but each each group is like one data point in that. Uh, each group is a whole group. You you hear it. Uh, um, you see, this is a group mean versus the uh, uh, local. So this is mean. This oh, is what is this overall mean of the three? Yeah. And k is the number of groups. Yes. So yeah, if you want to calculate, but uh, R, you, you don't need to worry about this. <laughs> So, <clears throat> so calculate f is uh, f is between group variance div div divided by the within group variance, and um, the larger the f, and the more we can see more a difference uh, cross groups versus within groups. So this is evidence against the uh, null hypothesis. So we are going to get a significant p value. We are going to reject the null hypothesis. We are seeing a significant effect. <clears throat> So the uh, drawback of this uh, ANOVA is that uh, the, uh, we, we can tell from signal p value there's uh, a difference between the groups, but not where the difference lines. So what we want to get is we need to some post hoc test. So post hoc test is basically after we find it's significant, we want to further test which, what's the difference, which two groups different, OK? So the, we are not talking about postdoc, which is uh, within metabolic analyst. You, you can uh, do this uh, analysis easily. And we just uh, cover this, uh, uh, what's different flavor of ANOVA. It's a one-way ANOVA. It's a uh, two-way ANOVA. So two-way ANOVA means you, you are testing more than, uh, you, you, you don't become male, female, control disease. So you have two factors in your design. OK, that's two-way ANOVA, yeah? Sorry. Um, so. <coughs> Let's say with ANOVA, if, if I have like 100 groups and they're all with very or relatively like a normal variance, whatever, within, within each group, but one of them is way off from the others, right? Yeah. Then the group variance still seems to be very small because, uh, you know, the, the distribution is so that everything's pretty like close together except for this one value, uh, except for one group. Right. And then, if I do the ANOVA, I just assume, oh, it's not a big uh, F, right? No, you'll get big F if the data F value is a, a really big, different. Right, but the more groups you have that are similar to each other, yeah. uh, the smaller your F gets if, if one group is a total outline, right? You need to normalize. Once you normalize that, uh, that one well won't be standard because what you describe actually, I'm thinking it's not normally distributed. If you really have a group, all the other group have a very equal, 99 group is equal. That one group is so different, and uh, you're talking about extreme things. But when you're analyzing that one, you need to normalize this. Once you normalize that, that one will be everything either bring up or that one going to bring back to more distribution. So I know your point, but uh, in reality, when you do the transformation, that the things will be uh, adjusted. You cannot just uh, uh, apply ANOVA in ANOVA in that kind of that kind of unless you artificially create that case. I'm just thinking about uh, the one you des uh, described. Yes, you're going to average get a group mean seems more uh, more uh, not affected by that outline. But uh, non-parametric ANOVA. What do you talking about that? No, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Let's I, say it's a drug test or something, yeah, right? Yeah. And no one took anything. In yeah. any of the other groups, but one yeah. group of people yeah. took some drug, and you know, there's just nothing in all the others. But I'm talking about extreme cases. Yeah. Yeah. I think now you're non parametric, probably going to help in that case. Yeah. So, conclusions that uh, mm, t tests assume uh, assess two groups, 
and uh, can compare two samples or one sample to a given value. So you can compare the like, sample with whether there's uh, a signal different from zero. ANOVA compare more than two groups, and uh, they compare between group variance against within group variance. And uh, now we're talking about p-values. I already mentioned about p-value before. And here we just uh, make sure we really <coughs> get it home. So the p-value is the probability that seeing a result at extreme or more extreme than a result from a given sample if the non-hypothesis is true. Basically, the p-value is that uh, what's the chance if uh, um, what's the chance you're willing to uh, accept if uh, if there's no uh, effect? Okay. So how do we calculate p-values? And we already know that uh, if our value is outside the three standard, devi uh, de standard deviation, we know that ch chance is less than 1%. Uh, we know it from normal. So if it's normally distributed, we can actually compute the p-values. And uh, But there are some cases that we don't, we cannot, because it's not normally distributed. We don't know what's the, mm, what's the chance uh, uh, of that. And so what we need to do uh, to, in order to get a robust p-values, uh, one is normalization. We try to normalize the data as much as possible because normal, no, using normal uh, distribution, the statistics are most robust and it's most efficient. Anything beyond the, doing you know, non-parametric or uh, doing permutation, we are going to discuss more, make things more complicated, okay? It's taking a lot of computing, so that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. But uh, let's say 19 percent is normally distributed. We are happy, but in some cases we need to do non-parametric test. And uh, so, uh, and in the extreme cases, we're pretty sure it's just uh, we don't know the distribution. We need to do permutation. So in large-scale studies, and uh, if you see the latest nature, compare com compare multiple omics, all different kind of complex cities, complexities. We nobody knows what's the distribution. The only way you can do is doing permutation. So we are going to discuss uh, briefly about these procedures. So uh, <coughs> normalization is uh, 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 di normal distribution is assumed in most uh, statistics, t-test, ANOVA. And we usually want to log transformation. The other one is z-score, called auto-scaling. So auto-scaling is also a term that's z-score. So we just have a, a mean zero standard deviation is one. It's called z-score. So it's easy to do in R, and but the auto-scale is a scale. Uh, in R, you can just get that. So there's no more distribution. <laughs> so um, box plot, if we're doing a, a standardized data, you can see that uh, relatively there's, uh, 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 there's a, a distribution around the mean or me uh, around the median. And so the uh, the mean in one is, for example, this uh, this one is very normally distributed, and uh, some of them like this is same the more problematic, but you, you you shouldn't aim for everyone to get the same like this, because if you have a large omics data, you apply this uh, uh, generally useful approach. Some will be happy, some will won't be. You, if you want to make everybody happy to be normally distributed, and uh, really you just uh, cannot do it, because uh, you're going to spend on individually and uh, doing individual analysis, that's fine, but uh, omics, uh, you don't do that. It's just uh, uh, you cannot afford the time, and uh, when, it's easy, when you're doing multi-omics, multi-variable studies, you just uh, 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 cannot do an individual difference. Yeah? Can you talk about this? Yeah. So, here you are using z-score, but this is without the transformation? This is a log transformation. I think it's, log, it's just for illustration. I'm not actually sure it's a, a, a log or z-score, but I think it's a log. Conceptually, you would do the transformation and then apply the uh, z-scale or does Oh, so this is z-score. It said it's z-score. Yeah, this is z-score. Okay. This score. You can see 0 and, uh, uh, and uh, 4 to 4, uh, minus 4 to 1. This is z-score. Okay, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, so, but conceptually, would you do the transformation and then do scaling or it doesn't matter if you do any of them to try to satisfy some <laughs> yeah, you do a log first, and uh, if it's still not, you can try to do a further apply this scaling. So the thing that the more transformation you do, and the more complex you're going to interpret your data. So that's the thing. So the uh, you you can do these things to make it more normal. But uh, uh, how do you relate this uh, transform the value to the original scale? That's uh, that's your you need to create a link. 
So that's a non-parametric test. So uh, w based on ranks and uh, the, uh, the the disadvantage is uh, there's lots of information. So you can see one thousand to one, its rank is one two, and from one point one to one point zero one, the same rank one two. So you can see the difference, the 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 quantity difference is being lost if we change convert to a uh, rank. So it's not. Um, it's useful, but uh, uh, not as powerful as parametric. So, what do you mean by power? Power means uh, <laughs> uh, the ability to detect a difference. If the difference is there, can you detect it? So, if you uh, convert to the unparametric, sometimes you just detect no difference. But if you the parametric, you found it. So that's uh, uh, the power we usually talk about. The other part is a very significant uh, concept called empirical p-values. So we can compute the p values from the normal distributed uh, uh, values like uh, t test ANOVA, but in some times we just don't know uh, whether it's normally uh, non normal distributed. So how do we do it? Is we do uh, a permutation and then can compute in the empirical p values. And how do we do that? Is that uh, we can create a null distribution computationally. Null distribution is that uh, uh, how do we create a null distribution? Is uh, by permuting this group labels. So if we really think that's two populations, like uh, uh, 100 patients, 15 is um, uh, 100 people, 15 is control, 15 disease, and this label is meaningful. Okay, really characterize the populations, two populations. And if that's a true, if we assume we randomly shuffle on the label, so put some patient label to the healthy label to healthy to patient, we we can calculate the same numbers whether the numbers the signal is become lower or different, right? So this is underlying assumption. If we really permute all these uh, labels, we still get the same statistics. Really means that the label is not meaningful. So do you think that's uh, patient uh, uh, healthy or control? And that's actually not meaningful because when I lay, randomly permute, I still get the same result. So it's random, right? So this empirical p-value is try to try to give you this confidence. If the p-value is very small, the chance of the random effect is very small. So you can confidently see, yeah, the pattern is real. The label actually carry this uh, carry this meaning. This control versus disease actually really uh, is. Um, <clears throat> Biologically, the patterns there, the signaling features are robust. Okay, so this is uh, what we try to do, and we don't do it uh, manually because this really takes a lot of time. But the computer is so good at this. What we're going to do is that uh, uh, we just uh, I give you the steps on the null hypothesis. All data comes from same distribution. Then we calculate the original statistics, just like the original t-test or f-test for for ANOVA. Then we shuffle the data labels with respect to group labels. Then we repeat, and we repeat a thousand times, millions of times. And the more you com compete, uh, compute, the more, and you still didn't find uh, anything is as good as the original one, the more confident you are. So if you re re shuffle one million times, you find the original one is still best. All the other uh, 9,900 9, things are very different. So it really means you are very, very significant. So your p-value is less than 1 in 1 million. But you cannot see your p-value is 0 because you, you didn't compute the infinite, which you cannot do it, right? And uh, if you all get this right, I'm not going to bother you with the details. Here is that uh, uh, we're basically showing you how, how you shuffle, the, uh, uh, shuffle these uh, labels. And uh, so, we, uh, so you, you can see that uh, we have the a case and control is de defined by so 1 to uh, 9 and 10 to uh, 18. So this is the uh, assignment. Now you can see if I'm uh, doing a shuffling. So the 9 came to here, and this one came to here. So we, we every time re we, we recomputed the mean. So we can see the mean values we computed for the shuffle. So now we repeat hundreds of thousands of times. So you, you want to see whether this uh, mean is uh, very close to the original is very different. Okay, well, if we're doing a lot, we can plot such a, such a uh, difference. So the difference uh, you observed here is here. 
And actually, if you're doing this, all the permutations, once you permute la label, you find it's very close. The difference is not so big, OK? And you, 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 you can see the signal is so strong. And uh, in that case, and you, you can see the p-value is less than 0 0.001, because you did it 1,000 times. And uh, none of them is good. So you cannot see 0, but uh, you can see the p less than 0 0.01. So this is very common in the large uh, omics studies. So the, I hope you understand this uh, permutation uh, procedures. You don't have to program it, but you just add, at least uh, you understand how it was uh, obtained. So general advantage is that you don't not do not rely on distributional assumptions. So normal, abnormal. So uh, so anything you can do, you can do permutation almost anything. That's what I'm saying. And also there's a hidden correlations in the variables. A lot of times omics uh, in some compounds is correlated with other compounds. And if you're doing permutation, this kind of structure cannot also be reviewed. So there's some advantage. The only disadvantage is uh, computational intensive. How you have to write a Procedure that's really try to recapture the reality only permuting that sample labels. So the, the thing that you need to be careful once you write the permutation procedures. This is a very uh, hard. This is a, a more customized. So different situation permutation on what, right? And uh, <clears throat> so here is a question: If you were asked to compute the empirical p-value from multiple groups, what will be the value to compute? And here, what we are going to comp compute is that uh, I already mentioned that F test. So if you want to compute, uh, uh, if you random shuffle the labels and within group uh, 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 variance versus the between group variance, will that change? So the original one is F value will be very high, and in the shuffled one, F value will be very low. If you find this pattern and uh, the signal is real, it's not random, right? If it's similar, then it, there's issues, right? And uh, I'm not sure. So here's the other issues we are, we're going to do is a hypothesis testing and the multiple testing issues. And uh, so usually we do the high, uh, uh, statistical test is uh, uh, we assume that uh, now hypothesis is true. Uh, basically, we assume there's no uh, no significance. Then what's the chance? If the chance is very low, we reject its now hypothesis. So this is a um, very traditional uh, approach. So I don't know what uh, there's uh, some issues. So uh, the goal is we make a statement regarding this uh, population uh, based on some of uh, with uh, there's some overlap. So let's see. So the uh, assume uh, okay. Here's a not that important. So the the uh, the assumption is that a sample is randomly selected. So we see then we uh, select from population. Then we select the null hypothesis, and then we based on null hypothesis we test the p values. So based on the threshold, usually 0 0.05, we're going to reject or not reject. So this is a very uh, uh, Ritual thing, and so it's it's um, so we follow this uh, consciously or unconsciously. So we already uh, talking about this. So if the p value very low, uh, very uh, small, and based on is then or cut off, we just reject it, and uh, we dis declare this uh, result statistically significant. And the issue here is that we do a multiple testing, so. Uh, we have the compounds in hundreds to thousands of uh, the peaks, uh, tens of thousands of peaks. So we're testing them multi times. So we're, we're willing to accept this uh, small <coughs> chance, 0 0.05 for each compound. But if we're doing the one, uh, like if we repeat 10,000 times, so the, the basically we are talking about the 500 uh, will be false positive. This is uh, the chance you, you ever, if you're uh, doing it. Uh, 100 times you have five, uh, five false positives. If we're doing 10,000 times, we're going to have five, 500 false positives. So this is an um, issue with uh, uh, multi-testing. How do we address this? And one way is very natural. We just improve the, uh, the stringency, the cutoff. We can, based on how many times we cut off, uh, we test. 
we just divide it by this, uh, uh, by p-values, by that uh, uh, number, make it more stringent. So, uh, for example, uh, if, uh, um, so the, this is called the corrected p-values. If we have this p-value to be significant enough, so even after doing this, all this kind of 10,000 uh, testing, the p-value uh, is still less than 0 0.05, so we can still be fine. And uh, this, is a, this is called a family-wise uh, uh, error rate. So the most famous one is called the Banfaroni corrections. So this is a, a lot of pe people use this. So if your data is very significant and you still, after doing the Banfaroni correction, it's still significant, really. That's a, that's a very conservative and very significant uh, p-values. And, uh, but a lot of times, if you're doing a bank run, you'll find out that uh, a lot of the features that are significant become not so significant. It's just because the bank run is so conservative. Try to uh, uh, try to make a safe bet, but in reality, this is uh, too conservative, and uh, uh, you lose a lot of the real signals, uh, the real significant uh, uh, features. So, um, yeah. Why not the source of the XMS online is this cloud plot, the, the most significant features that you get from an experiment you might have. And some of them are both corrected, some of them are not. Which ones do we really have to go for? I don't use XMS online, so, and uh, I think, uh, so this would be consistent. What, you, what you're saying that uh, <coughs> Some is Bamperoni correct, some is not. They don't give you option to uh, use Bamperoni or not? No, they just show the, the red ones are Bamperoni correct, and yeah. so and the blue ones are not. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a kind of dilemma everybody is facing. It's, uh, even me, I say I'm doing metabolic analysis. Sometimes um, Bamperoni correct basically give you more confidence, but you don't want to uh, disregard people, uh, the features that not as Bamperoni uh, corrected, but not signal because there's like false discovery rate also give you some things. So, it, so it's up to you uh, what you're going to choose. If you really have a lot of the signal features, you can use the most conservative ones. You still have lots. But if you don't, and you can use the FDR false discovery rate adjusted, you still have much to think about. So the statistics are not really the truth. It just help you to select, prioritize. And if you too much trust, use the cutoff. And if really below it is no true biological signals. That's not true. Statistics is statistics. Reality, biology is there. If you really feel that feature even below this, um, all the cutoff, but you really have your gut feeling, this is my significant molecule. And you do the validation, and it's significant. All statistics just uh, don't work, right? So I think in the tools like XMS Online, even Metabolic Analyst, shouldn't make a judgment for you. It's just reveal the information as much as possible, make you, let you to think, let you to make a judgment. So, um, yeah. So here's that uh, false discovery rate. And uh, uh, this is uh, very popular. So in metabolic analysis, we use a uh, false discovery rate because it's a reasonable compromise between uh, a very liberal raw p-values versus a Banfaroni. So the uh, FDR 0.05 is that 5% among the significant genes will be false positive. So this is, uh, if we have 100 genes, 100 compounds is uh, significant on uh, 5%. That's uh, five of them. So I'm just, uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I think, the, why it's 20%. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I will, this is some, so it's five, five it will be, uh, by controlling FDR, when can we, we can choose how much we want, want to do. So the, actually, if we use FDR, I know a very a more general. People can use 0 0.1, 0 0.15, if you're really uh, willing to stretch it. So you, uh, FDR is um, not 0 0.05. FDR can be slightly higher. And uh, so high dimensional data. And uh, yeah, please. Um, I was in a situation where I couldn't use any tool. My, my automatic statistical tool expired, so I had to do FDR manual, and that taught me so well how FDR works. It's actually pretty cool. You can do it in Excel. You go step by step. You're saying this is bigger than that. It's all about ranking y
three hours doing it, you'll know that you have by far two hours standing Yeah. So it's a good idea to actually look at how it works as well. Yeah. I suggest if you have or really want to go to that direction, that's a, a hard call. Thanks. <coughs> and, uh, so high dimension data, we all talk about this uh, um, uh, very basic uh, uh, t-test uh, ANOVA. And, uh, and now we're going to talk about multivariate statistics. So uh, mm, multivariate actually is more natural for this omics data because it's, uh, it, it's considering all compounds simultaneously. We know the compounds are not working by themselves alone, uh, independently. It, it's actually working in the pathways, in a biological process. A lot of them are actually interconnected, one, one way or the other. So it's a, it's a system, and we should consider the whole system in one go rather than separately. So multivariate statistics naturally fit there. And uh, so they consider all these uh, variables together. And um, so for example, your taste, your per personal profile, your height, weight, your hair color, your clothing, your eye color, everything. That's individually, uh, you, a lot of people share the same height and share the same uh, weight. Uh, but if all this put together, it's you. It's unique you. It's your profile. So it's, uh, we need to put all together. Let's become multivariate descriptor of you. So that's, uh, and this is the same thing, multivariate descriptor of a metabolome for a particular sample for a particular population. So multivariate statistics uh, is, um, uh, is, uh, is um, superior in this, uh, in this sense. It's just uh, how do we have a multivariate to actually capture the reality, the complexity that's uh, a lot of uh, development going on. But we just go to the basic thing that uh, uh, normal distribution this is a single variable and we can do a bivariate normal you can see it's an oval shape and then if you project to each one dimension you can see the normal distribution on each one and if we're doing a trivariate normal you can see that uh, uh, it's a globe and you can project in each uh, each uh, directions and like then this so uh, re reality is that uh, <clears throat> Uh, we, we can visualize to up to three dimensions. The reality, when we go to the multi dimension, 10 dimensions, 100 dimensions, and we cannot visualize easily. And uh, most of the statistics developed in early days is for univariate. They assume very unreasonably you have uh, uh, um, two or three, uh, you, you just have a focus on one variables, but you have uh, so many samples, observations, basically hundreds of things. And uh, it, it's all fine. You're doing a linear regression, doing the t-test, uh, logistic stuff. It's so I learned all that uh, early days. But once you use these tools, go to omics data, metabolomics, uh, gene expression, and none of them can be used directly because that uh, the the assumption is violated. So we need to uh, really uh, <clears throat> use a new approach. And uh, special challenges. Uh, we have much large of variables than the number of samples. So the n much less than the p. So n is your variable number, p is the sample number. So what we do is that uh, we still use univariate uh, uh, statistics to try to help us to understand the data and because it's simple and people know it, so it's still useful. Uh, but in reality, we want to describe the overall pictures and we try to use this uh, multivariate machine learning, camel metrics, visualization tools. And uh, <clears throat> I give you some terms. Uh, in the machine learning, there's two general approach. One is called the unsupervised learning. Uh, unsupervised means it's, uh, uh, they just explore your data without looking at your sample labels. So they don't know whether it's sampled from healthy or from uh, diseased one. So they just reveal the patterns hidden within the sample. If really you see from this unsupervised approach, you see the samples naturally distributed according to their sample labels. Control is one group, disease is one group. Then that's really, you see your sample, uh, your study, or the, the data really contains the signals because that's sig it's really standing out by themselves. And, uh, but a lot of time is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the data, uh, your study design, a lot of times, is being confounded by a lot of other factors, and uh, uh, 
you cannot control, especially in large population studies. And if you really just visualize data or use unsupervised, and you, you see this mixed, mixed together, and uh, <clears throat> signal, it's not have no signal, it's just signal being buried uh, within. And in this case, you should you try to use supervised learning. Supervised learning is try to find out um, these hidden signals by using some linear or sometimes unlinear things. They refer that is when you in order to find these signals, they need to see find out what's the signal, what's not signal related to your labels. So basically, they not only use your data, also use the labels. So they know they need to see oh this feature related to the disease, this feature related to uh, uh, healthy. By doing this, they found the signals. Then we distill and extract the signals, and they uh, let you see it. So the <clears throat> supervised method, the supervised learning, is more powerful, and it can let you see the patterns. But on the other hand, it can be over powerful or uh, overfit. Basically, it will reveal patterns that's not there, but they try to please you because you ask him to do it. It just to show you the patterns, and so. Supervised learning, you really need to do cross validation. Just basically hide a certain data uh, with no labels. And okay, you you you, you said you found the patterns. Now here's new data. Uh, tell me which one is from which uh, is healthy or disease. So this kind of thing for supervised learning, you really need to consider about uh, cross validation and the permutation to make sure that the pattern they found is real. Because machine learning is very powerful, and a lot of times it gives you some false patterns. It's uh, it's so easy to to make you naively believe there's something real. But unsupervised learning is uh, more or less uh, safe uh, because it reveals the patterns natural in hidden, uh, naturally within the da data. So it's, uh, you don't have to justify it. So that's, that's Could it. Could put the cross validator in the unsupervised learning? You can do that, but uh, you, it's you not required, what I'm saying. Yeah, so if you really uh, want to do the clustering pattern, you can do in some permutation, see what, how stable is the cluster. You can do 100 to see how much time this is still to that. It's, uh, uh, there's some, a lot of variations at each step. And what I'm telling, because we have very limited time and uh, things, we're just telling uh, some very general things. And advanced uh, step, at each, each step, we have a lot of flavors. So. So on super learning, we have two approaches. One is clustering. One is uh, uh, just uh, called dimension reduction. Uh, dimension reduction, most uh, we're talking about the principal common analysis. But a lot of people also think about PCA is also clustering. Because in PCA space, uh, if the dots close to each other, they also like a cluster. They're also similar to each other. So we can really uh, put them together if you wish. So clustering is that a process by which objects are logically similar in uh, that are logically similar in characteristics are grouped together. So we want to find out uh, the things that are similar to each other, we put it together. So this is, seems very intuitive, OK? But we, we are not doing it manually. We let computer to do it. That's the thing. So what we need to do, uh, do we, in order to do clustering is that uh, how do we measure the similarity? So we need to marry the. Uh, which variables or which <laughs> samples are more similar to each other. And we also need to decide at what threshold they, they are similar, similar enough. We can see they belong to a cluster, OK? And also, we, how, how do we arrange them? What's the distance? So we put them far away from each other, close to each other. So also, the other one's called the cluster seed. So we need to begin from somewhere. We start from random samples, random variables, so we can this is a lot of thinking, but in reality is that um, we have a lot of tools already implemented, and uh, uh, some of them actually prove very useful generally. So we can try to understand them and see uh, how it works. So uh, two, uh, two common clustering algorithms. One is called the k-means or partition method. So they, they try to divide the an object into m clusters with or without overlap. So there's a, a you need to uh, define how many clusters you want to get. So you can see the n object, n object, n means your sample numbers. So you, you, know, you know you have 100 samples, but how many clusters you, 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 you sometimes you don't know. And you think it's five clusters, three clusters, or 10 clusters. So this is something you require, you need to have some prior knowledge about how many clusters you get. But you can explore and see 
when the other one's easy. Most commonly used the hierarchical method. So basically, you do the clustering from the bo bottom. Uh, everything is one big cluster, and divided everything became to an individual cluster. Yeah. And um, so this is you don't have to uh, make a decision how many clusters you just. Uh, uh, see the patterns from layers, and finally you choose a one because they give you reveal your everything. So, <clears throat> k-mean clusters, and assume we uh, we know uh, how many number of uh, cluster there, and uh, uh, we just uh, then the computer will choose a random seed and try to put the samples who close to your seed and reorganize things. And if very close enough, they will merge it. Then they recompute. Uh, the new center and re re repeat the whole process again and again until it stabilizes, converge, never, never shift around. So you get this uh, stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry, I may be being obtuse, but um, we're comparing two farms from two patients, right? Uh, and, uh, what, and what are we comparing? Because we got a hundred measurements on one patient, a hundred measurements on the other patient. Yeah. So what are we comparing? To decide similar or different. First is that uh, we are, we're not looking at two patients, we're looking at hundreds of patients, okay? We're really talking about uh, uh, 15 is healthy, 15 is disease, okay? And uh, we have the uh, um, metabolites measurement across uh, like 100 metabolites <coughs> measured for this 100 patient for each of them, right? And we just compare their concentration profiles for across these 100 uh, metabolites. So are they similar enough to each other? So what do you compare? Still don't see what yeah, we compare whether this, is, for example, the healthy. Uh, if we see the, if we visualize an Excel spreadsheet, you have all the concentration tables. If you think about the normal patient, the healthy, they have concentration is more similar to each other. It have low, everything is low, and disease, everything is high. You want to compare the concentration, the trend, the patterns, the concentration pat values. For all these metabolites, merit. This is what we are comparing. We, this is the same thing like what we uh, do in a t-test on a particular metabolite, but this time we are comparing all meta more metabolites together. This is called multivariate. It's a very long. Uh, for each yeah, for each uh, compound, they have 100 measurement because they have 100 uh, uh, kind of the things. Okay. I think uh, once we see the real data, you you will see what we are comparing. And here is just k-mean clustering. And uh, before we have no um, uh, no group assignment, and we just randomly assign them. To, okay, we think they are going to two cluster. Okay, this cluster you need to decide. There are some ways to help you. And now they try to uh, recolor uh, or clustering this uh, mm -mm, uh, dots according to clo distance to this <coughs> seed. Okay, after that, they recomputed the new center. And after recomputing the new center, they also now reassign this group. And then now, after that, the new center is close to here, and everything close to here became uh, the same color, okay? So the new, uh, uh, then uh, after that, they can do a several permutation, but at this time, they become stable. They, they don't change a lot. So if you're doing three, four, ten times, all the, the new center to, to the previous center, they not change. So the most change actually here. This you randomly drop, and they move to here, and it, and after here they probably sh shift a little bit to the center. But after that it will stabilize. So that means, uh, so uh, well, after you do some random start and uh, converge, so this is a guarantee that uh, the patterns you found is more or less more robust. So hierarchical clustering. I think uh, most of us are already familiar with. It. So. We just join the one who's most similar, then move on to the other, and all the way join everything. All from everything together, all the way to everything is individual. So this is easy. <coughs> so how do we do the hierarchical clustering? We need to calculate distance between each uh, samples uh, or between each features. Then we put them in the uh, clusters, and the uh, most similar one will combine and recalculate the whole thing again, and we go back. And each layer will come create a cheese, and each layer gradually join, move move all the way up to the top. So this is a, a kind of the iterative uh, process until everything is done. But uh, 
uh, similarity. So how do we calculate similarity? This is probably help answer your question is that we try to com com complete a distance between like C, two samples, okay? This is from patient A, this is patient B. Uh, and we can compute it at each metabolize. We just do it, do it. Uh, metabolize uh, uh, A plus metabolize B plus metabolize C. Uh, so all the metabolize for that two patients, we are going to uh, compute it and add it up together as one distance between these two patients, okay? And uh, here is uh, all measurement for this patient. Here's some all measurement for that patient. We can calculate the distance, just use Euclidean distance. So, and we get a number. So if it's very similar, uh, you see, if it's identical, you get a zero, okay? Uh, so it's the difference very low. Uh, uh, well, you get a very close distance, right? So this is very natural. And the other one is that this is the similarity, this Euclidean distance. The other one is a Pearson correlation. And this is a chain of similarity. And uh, uh, let me show that. So this one has this uh, 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 positive correlation, negative correlation. So this is positive correlation. All the chain is uh, uh, synchronized. So you can see have changes uh, co uh, consistently. And this one is a change in operator direction. So if you Pearson correlation, uh, yeah. So the, that's the that's Pearson correlation and the Euclidean distance, okay? The clustering, and you are going to see some parameters called a single linkage. Single linkage is that uh, if we have two clusters, what's the distance between these two clusters? And a single linkage try to find the dots that's so close to each other, okay? The most the closest the dots, and they have this distance, okay? And uh, 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 this is single linkage. The complete linkage. Complete li linkage is uh, find the furthest dots. So this two is complete linkage. And uh, it's tend to generate clumps. So they, uh, this kind of if you really play around, you will see this pattern. It's very uh, typical. Actually, when I see certain things, I can see, okay, generate from this plus the other one. Uh, very commonly used, average. So basically, you, you have this center. You just find the computing center. It's called average. The other one is called a ward. It's also used. The ward is very close to average, but uh, it has certain uh, adjustment. It's, uh, uh. Here's a typical... Um, <clears throat> Result you'll get from hierarchical clustering. So you're from uh, uh, most closest put together. <laughs> then you found the second closest to this one. So you merge these two and find another one. You gradually merge more. And eventually you get from everything and create a huge uh, patterns. So by doing this, you find the similar ones close to each other and the similar one to the further away. But uh, you can see the pattern actually standing out. So this is a... Uh, uh, so PCA, the PCA is that uh, we talked several times, and uh, a PCA try to find the most variance of the data, and the assumption is uh, the main direction of change is also the your data characteristics. So if your data really have no other influence from other experimental factors, so the difference uh, will be the correlated to your experimental stuff. I know I still have uh, some. We take a break or what? I think in ten ten minutes I'll finish. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> um, PC is uh, you can think about it as a clustering, uh, but it's uh, uh, try to uh, most people think it's a projection. Okay, and this is a uh, think about from three dimensional space. You have the flashlight, you project them, and you can see. At the lower space, and uh, one dimension actually cap captures this uh, uh, like an oval shape, the bagel, uh, the, the oval shape. It's called character. The other dimension captures less. So the PCA actually help you to choose the dimension that have the most uh, capture most uh, variance of the data. So if this variance is your experimental condition caused, so you you are safe. But sometimes your result. Uh, a mixture of multi factors. So the PCA probably revealed we revealed a lot of time PCA revealed patterns of your batch effect. What I'm saying is batch effect cause a huge issue. So you can see, oh, this is day running day one, this is running day two. So PCA actually tell you uh, very clearly because that's have a strong influence on your data. So if you don't address them properly. 
So, <clears throat> so how do we compute PCA? And uh, you, if you want to manually, and here's the ways you <laughs> uh, you want to to do. Uh, there's a, actually it's a easy, it's a linear thing. You just combine um, uh, all this uh, weight for each uh, variable. You combine even the weight and project back to this uh, uh, score T1 uh, to other ones. So the T1 will capture the most variance. T2 will cap capture less, most second, and T3 all the way. But we usually w w focus on the T1 and T2, and uh, then we look at which variable contribute the most by looking at the weight. Weight is this P. So it's this P is big, that means that contribute enough to the patterns on your data. Okay. So PCA is a linear combination of all the variables. Try to project. So we even we don't think uh, we don't just it's multi dimension. You don't have to. But on the basic, it's like this. So <clears throat> again, this is your score. We mainly focus on score one, two, or three. So top score plot, and we want to focus the loading is a a two. This is loading. So this is your raw variable. This is your variables like. Uh, uh, metabolize one, metabolize two. So if the weight is high, that really means these metabolites have a high influence. The score is uh, what you're going to see the patterns. So from pattern, you want to go back to the loading. This is uh, this weight is your loading. Okay. <clears throat> so I give you another view of PCA is that uh, uh, each uh, T is uh, uncorrelated. So T1 and T2 is orthogonal. So try to be give you independent information. Uh, on the same thing. So T1 is give you much uh, <coughs> variance, and T2 is the second la largest one. So the, T, the first uh, component that gives you the largest variance of the data. So if the largest variance happens to be your experiment uh, cost, then you are fine. Sometimes the first one is a batch effect. You look at this T2 versus T3 or T, T3 versus T4. And because the top one actually batch effect, the second one is actually carry your disease versus control. So you need to see several uh, component and uh, so, so principal component uh, analysis is that uh, because uh, uh, we can do the transformation in the data, we can calculate this PCA on a covariance matrix, also on a correlation matrix. So the, the <clears throat> so this is uh, how we normalize the data, how we uh, doing the things. So the correlation matrix is basically you do a log, auto scaling, and the variance uh, can can have the different units. All the variable have the same impact on the variance. Covariant if we do a covariance matrix, some large value is going to have a strong effect. So sometimes you you are not sure what's the best one. You can choose uh, how you normalize your data. If you're doing log uh, auto scaling, you're really doing a correlation matrix. Okay. Here is a typical result we are going to see from a, um, a PCA analysis is that uh, you see you have this uh, uh, spectrus and from different patients when you are doing a PCA you can see it's correlated with a, a, it's nicely classed in different uh, places within a, a, a within a PCA and uh, you're happy and now you want to see which features contribute to this and you back to it's called a loading plot. Loading plot shows uh, how much of the variables contribute to the different uh, uh, com components. I already show you that uh, formula. So it's actually weight when you multiply your uh, uh, metabolites. So it also have the sign, positive, negative. So that this is uh, this one we are plotting here. So that when you see loading plot, you want to look at the same location. So you see here, and uh, this is uh, patterns you see here. And then you're going to look at the features here. Basically, this one going to be positively correlated with this uh, uh, features here. So they are correlated. And here, and you'll see here is a positive correlated there. So um, I have a more simplified stuff is that uh, you can see the score plot, this loading plot. So you, you want to see here uh, this feature. And this is your samples located here. And this kind of measurement is positively correlated with, your, with this green group and this one. Uh, this feature going to be negatively correlated with this green group because this is located within the opposite direction, but it is a co positively correlated with here. So very intuitive, okay? Same direction, positive correlated. Opposite direction is uh, 
negatively correlated. So it's drive the separation pattern. It's why PCA is so intuitive, why they use because the interpretation is actually very visually um, intuitive. So, so uh, PCA is that uh, PCA will not succeed in some time in clear clustering. Uh, no matter how many things, uh, how, many, how, how many different transformations you tried. And uh, sometimes if that's the case, and uh, it basically means the signal uh, in your data uh, is not strong uh, revealed in the PCA. In this case, you, you probably want to try more uh, supervised approach. So, but PCA is very good for data overview and for outlier direction. Uh, detection for looking at the relationship between different variables. So uh, again, PCA is uh, your first. Your first, uh, you should have view your data like first, like a box plot. PCA you also need to you need to see the PCA. PLSDA is similar to PCA. The only difference is the PLSDA use the group labels. You try to maximize the covariance and uh, between your data and the variables. So it tend to always produce a separation. Tend always it's because that means that it's really eager to please you. It give you something better, but you need to be cautious about that. Whether it's really true or something is just uh, uh, artificial. So, and you can see the comparison actually is um, always better. So from P PCA to PLSDA. Again, the caution is that PLSDA is uh, based on regression. At first, uh, convert uh, uh, class labels to the numbers and perform PSD regression, and it's very susceptible to overfitting. Okay, this is a very well known fact for PSDA. So it's widely used, but you really need to pay attention to overfit. So you need the cross validation and you need the permutation. So this is a cross validation. I'm just to quickly cover. So cross validation is your. Sorry, quick question about yeah. PCA. So is it allowed or not? Uh, to let's say, if, or does it change it if you pre-filter your data? I guess then it makes it like a supervised method, right? Uh, uh, it's a gray area. And people are actually doing it. Filter the data based on the fold chain, or based on some t-test, filtering that. And really, if you do that, your PC will be very significant. But if you really review that, I'm the reviewer, and then it's a <laughs> comment on that. So it's a, you can do something if you want to fill the data based on the signal to noise, but don't use the group label. Okay. okay. The worst case, which I see in many papers, is that people actually filter before PLSDA. Oh. No, even PCA, if you're doing the filtering a lot, you're going to get the patterns because you feel the things uh, not correlated. You get the patterns more coherent towards that uh, separation. So uh, it's, uh, it's so, a. So it should be like that, let's say, in like two populations, and there's maybe. You feel the data. Different, or 10 uh, metabolites that are really different between them. Will that show in a PCA out of like 100,000 metabolites? So uh, there's data filtering in metabolites. You will see that uh, the filtering is based on uh, overall stuff, don't based on your group labels, okay? Based on the signals, the quality of the data, and not based on the variance across the whole things. They don't regard into the group label. If you really filter based on group label, it's true. I shouldn't be doing it, but if you're doing a little bit, 5%, sometimes people are okay. I know it's very popular in the microarray uh, RNA seq stuff. And, um, but in general, it's uh, frowned upon. So if you don't review it, it's fine. If you review it, I'm definitely going to write a comment on that. You shouldn't do that. So that's, uh, um, you shouldn't fill the data based on the group label uh, before doing an analysis, which will make it much uh, nicer always. So cross-validation is uh, for the validator of PLSDA. So this is very intuitive. You hold your data, uh, one part. You divide the data into a three part and uh, use to train your model and predict that uh, uh, on the test model. So you repeat it three times. And you can do it, uh, if you have very less number of samples, you can do it, leave one out. You can, so you can do it multi times because sometimes three fold, you don't get a very smooth uh, 
fat ends, so you can do it. So cross validation used to determine the optimal number of components used to build a PLSDAD model. And uh, <clears throat> because PLSDAD, you want to, when you're doing a prediction, you want to use the first, uh, uh, second, uh, uh, com uh, cross validation first. Yeah. Yeah. This is a cross validation. You have a threefold. And this is a leave, uh, uh, leave one out cross validation, unfold. So it's the same, but it's basically you use, uh, if you have 100 samples, you're doing 99 uh, to build a model, predict one. So you repeat 100 times. So this time it's really more average, more granular average. So, it's, uh, uh, so you can do tenfold cross validation. So it's all cross validation, just different flavors. So uh, component and the features. So PSDA, because you're doing a builder model to predict, you want to see how many components you want to in, 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 uh, involved. So you, you can uh, use a, a R square and a Q square. R square is the sum of the square, uh, sum, of, uh, sum of squares captured by the model. And uh, uh, cross-validated uh, R square is called a Q square. And so a Q square is more Objective so R squares um, based on your training so Q squares based on your cross validation and also you can based on the prediction accuracy so they will see how many components you use to get the best uh, performance and this one is uh, uh, commonly used so cross validation and help you determine what's the best model <clears throat> and the other one is permutation is try to decide whether the signal is significant we already discussed about the um, how permutation is done, and it's, it's exactly the same thing. You can do two groups or three groups, and you're doing a permuting, and you calculate the empirical p-values. So this uh, uh, p-value less than 0.01, this means if you're doing a 1,000 test, and none of them is as good as your original labels. So this is a safe. If your label is in the middle, so that really means that you are not quite sure. It's not it means your model is fake or false. It just means this PSD model uh, your confidence on that is very low. You just because randomly you can also get the same patterns. So uh, the other part is the PRS VIP score. So VIP score is a summary of the uh, your loadings uh, together with the uh, 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 weights. So it's a weighted sum of the square the correlation between the PRS component and the original variables. So it is uh, commonly used in uh, metabolomics to see what's the <coughs> Feature is most important. So you can use the loadings, and by the PLS VIP seems more captures more information. So you just uh, the it's a weighted sum, and the weights corresponding to the percentage of variance explains that PLS component. So the PLS VIP VIP more than one, uh, people use that as a cutoff. It's more significant. And biomarkers less than one is less. And the uh, metabolites give you some uh, summaries, and you can actually see the plot, and they are changed with regard to different conditions. So this is the last comment. Re so this score can be used for the identified down layer? Did you replace them? No. <laughs> it's, VIP scores uh, help you to decide which features are more co uh, correlated with your conditions, the biomarkers. It's not for bio outlier. Outlier is, uh, uh, outlier is not 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 necessarily uh, it's not in this context. Okay. So here is a <clears throat> regression. So regression we don't uh, compute in the uh, accuracy prediction. We use the um, uh, the the the, the uh, RMS in root mean standard deviation. This one is uh, if you have the uh, result is not is uh, the the it's not a patient healthy or control. It's actually a quantitative uh, uh, result, like a weight. Uh, uh, so you can you can do the <coughs> regression. So classification uh, um, performance, we can do the uh, accuracy. Accuracy means out of how many times you, you are right. So nine out of thirteen, you get ninety sixty nine percent right. Error rate is. Uh, Y minus uh, accuracy is 31 percent. So uh, this is uh, uh, some kind of issues you uh, if you are unbalanced. So I have 
one sample is a disease, 99 is healthy. If I always see in the healthy, I'm 99% right, which is not a useful model to predict. So it's not balanced because if the sample imbalanced, this become an issue. So for this imbalance, the, the data what's the most useful is sensitivity, specificity. Okay, sensitivity is a, out of how many times you uh, percentage you see right actually right, and specificity is a, how many percentage you see the wrong. Actually, it is wrong. Oh, you see, it's healthy. It's healthy. You see, the disease is the disease. So the sensitivity, the specificity, you can see that. So if we combine this uh, sensitivity, specificity, and we use different, uh, uh, we use different cutoff. At this threshold, we think it's disease. We think it's normal. We have calculated sensitivity and specificity. We can actually create a curve called the RC curve. It's the receiver operating characteristics uh, curve. So it's widely used for clinical biomarkers. So it's combining true positive versus a false positive rate. And uh, I just uh, show you in this thing. So you have the two populations. You have different uh, cutoffs. And uh, at each cutoff, you're going to have certain sensitivity specificity. And based on the values, you can get this uh, dots. And you connect them, they get an RC curve. So it's a uh, RC curve seems uh, kind of slightly um, not intuitive, but if you really spend some time thinking about it, it's actually combining uh, both sensitivity and specificity. So if you choose RC curve, have a cutoff at a certain range, you have the optimal sensitivity, optimal specificity. So this is why it's widely used for clinic biomarkers. So here's the regions that uh, you have the uh, much high specificity, low sensitivity. Here's high sensitivity, low specificity. Here's balanced one. So you can see where you want your cutoff be, be, before. So area on the RC curve. So how do we have a one single value combining sensitivity and specificity? Is that uh, we use the area on the curve. So it's uh, um, we can compare different uh, data models. So if we have the RC curve, the area on the curve is 95%. It's all good. and. Uh, uh, random, it's 15%. So in between, you can see the 17 and 18%. So usually, you want to be, for clinical, you want to be 18, 18, 5%. 70% is still not good. And I know you get a 75%, you can get published there, but it's just not a, a, a good, the good one, you need to be high. So there's other supervised methods, like SIM, SIMCA, OPS, DA, a support vector machine, random forest. So a lot of them actually in the analyst, but it's very advanced. and. Uh, in, we're not going to cover them. And uh, you can think about, uh, uh, we cover the basics, and there's uh, unsupervised is, uh, is uh, more uh, basic things. It's more powerful, like uh, big cannons and uh, machine learning, all the neural network is really, really super powerful stuff. There. And this is your data, try to help you overcome stuff. Sorry, generally, uh, though, like, uh, infinite effect is large enough like an unsupervised method should pick it up? Yes. You really only need supervised and the machine learning to like, get at the subtle stuff? Is exactly. that kind of a fair yeah. So if, uh, if, you're, if your pattern is strong, that biological effect is very strong, it will pick up easily unsupervised. Okay. And uh, you have your PC and you show the good separation, you have your biological story, everybody yeah. is happy. It's done. You yeah. don't need to use PLSD because you already have pattern there, right? Okay. <clears throat> so data analysis, unsupervised, from supervised, and um, so a statistical significance. So the statistical significance, especially for unsupervised, you need to do some cross-validating permutation, and to make sure it's it's fit, uh, it's a real signal. Unsupervised is generally safe, and people you don't query about it. So, um, the so note of caution is that uh, um, supervised clock equation are powerful, and learn from the labels. And, uh, uh, and from perform pattern recognition. And uh, too many people <coughs> skip the PCA and the class during direct supervised. You found the patterns, they're happily to send out the manuscript and get uh, snipped because, uh, uh, yeah, reviewers actually knows. So you actually you do your homework, actually follow steps, and uh, do the precautions. And uh, if. Uh, so if you use supervised um, method like C style of PSD, you need to do cross validation, permutation, and report the uh, R squares, Q squares, and uh, really refer to the literature 
and uh, which tools you use, what parameter you used. So really, if you still don't see the pattern separation, it really means that your data don't have strong signals. You need to increase the uh, large sample size or, or, or have a better design. So if that's reality, then that's the negative result. People are not happy, but uh, a lot of time it's, it's the case, clinical studies like this. Thank you.